12. The Night Beat starts right now. We begin tonight with several deadly shootings in the past 24 hours, keeping San Antonio police very busy. One today on the east side left a man dead and two others critically injured. As the night team's Lee Waldman reports, it came just hours after a rally to end gun violence. Heartbreaking moments of families holding on to one another after losing a loved one to a shooting on the east side at the Antioch Village Apartments. This was not a random shooting. This was, a, this was targeted for a specific individual. Chief William McManus says a vehicle with several people were waiting at the apartments for a man the chief called an intended target. That man walked out of an apartment to meet with several people in a different vehicle. That's when the two groups opened fire. Three people were shot. One died at the scene and two others were taken in critical condition to the hospital. Afterwards, chaos ensued. An officer with San Antonio Police Department was allegedly punched in the face. Relatives who wanted to get to the decedent and when they were not allowed on into the crime scene, that's when things kind of got ugly. Two members of the media were also assaulted. One of our photographers had her camera pushed to the ground. The shooting came just hours after a rally demanding an end to gun violence also on the east side at Phyllis Wheatley Park. We lost family members, friends, and community uh, partners to gun violence, and the community violence uh, needs to end. June is Gun Violence Awareness Month. Advocates show support by wearing orange. Today, several groups like Big Mama's Safe House and Moms Demand Action held this rally to get the community to come together against gun violence. Everyone is tired of, of the way the status quo and we're, we're just fed up and we're going to we're going to make a change. Chief McManus says at this time they're not releasing information about the suspects involved in the shooting at the Antioch Village Apartments. Today's rally against gun violence come ahead of a sit-in planned at our nation's capital, demanding elected leaders pass an assault weapons ban. Back to you. Thank you, Lee. A Bear County Sheriff's deputy shot and killed a man who attacked his own family. It all happened this morning at a home near I-10 and Fair Oaks Parkway. When deputies arrived at that home, a man with a knife allegedly charged at the deputy who then fired his gun in self-defense. BCSO says the man was at his family's home to do some repairs when he got into a dispute with the family members. It's unknown right now what that fight was about. Deputy backpedaled uh, several feet before pulling his weapon and, and firing at least uh, two or three times. That suspect was struck and uh, was pronounced dead here on the scene. The deputy and some of the man's family members were also injured, but they are all expected to recover. The search continues tonight for the suspect who murdered a man following an argument at an east side soccer field. Last night, just after 10, police were called out to the soccer field near the south side Lions Park on Roland Avenue. Officers say, according to witnesses, during an argument, a spectator pointed a gun at another spectator and fired, hitting the victim in the chest. He was rushed to the hospital where he died. The suspect took off after that shooting. To weather now, last night's storm was loud and electric. A big portion of our viewing area seeing rain, lightning, strong winds, or all three. That storm even caused thousands of power outages. It certainly did. And despite the heat and sunshine today, the rain, ch rain chances are sticking around again tonight. Mia tracking the latest on radar, and it is lighting up right now, Mia. Yep, it sure is. We have plenty of storms to talk about, especially across our far southwestern counties. You can see outside with live cam right now, not a whole lot going on near the downtown area, but we already have managed to find a few showers across far western Bear County. So let's get you a look at what we are looking at right now. You can see it's not for everybody this hour, but especially across portions of the Winter Garden, that's where we do have some pockets of moderate to even heavy rain fall. This is non severe, so that is good, but some gusty winds, some pockets of heavy rain and some lightning will need to be monitored for. Again, we were talking about the potential for a few showers and storms here near Bear County over the next hour or so. We do have some of that activity even near Rio Medina, so stretching into eastern Medina County there too. And really up I-35 closer to the Austin area, that's where some severe thunderstorms have been getting going here tonight. That activity is pushing farther off to 
to the southeast, potentially could clip far eastern Gonzales and even Lavaca County. So we'll be keeping eyes on that as well. Here in San Antonio and surrounding areas, not finished with the storm chances. Through the overnight, it's possible we find some additional scattered activity develop. And yet again, as we head into our Sunday afternoon. So we'll get you a look at the future cast, another in-depth look at the radar coming up here in just a few minutes, guys. The event. Now to a developing story we've been following today. A West Campus high school coach and teacher no longer with the district after being arrested on Friday night. The charge improper relationship between an educator and student, which is a second degree felony. The arrest affidavit states 32 year old Alejandro Ramiro Pena was having sexual relations with the student beginning back in August 2022 when the teen was 16. An outcry by that victim this week prompted a criminal investigation that uncovered phone conversations and evidence in Pena's office. He was bonded out of jail and has a no contact order with the victim. South San An Antonio ISD releasing a statement saying Mr. Pena was immediately put on administrative leave when the investigation began and is no longer an employee of the district. South San Antonio ISD will continue to cooperate with law enforcement to ensure the safety and well-being of our students, family and community. Tonight, the teen's father also sent a statement to KSAT saying in part, quote, we are just glad that he was charged and booked and now that his face is out there. So anyone else that has been taken advantage of can speak up End quote. The weekend already proving to be a busy one for San Antonio firefighters. A fire at the reserve at Pecan Valley apartment home sent one person to the hospital with burns. It was at 2.20 this morning when the firefighters say flames engulfed a first floor apartment. Crews were able to get control of it and eventually put that fire out. Two people were taken to the hospital. One was serious burns and we're told the other person was involved in some type of assault before firefighters got there. SAPD took someone into custody and they were questioned by fire investigators. Another fire, this one burning up one home and forcing crews to evacuate the home next door. It all happened around midnight at a home in the 400 block of Blue Bonnet Street near North Givers Street. Firefighters say that the uh, fire was rapidly growing. They evacuated the people inside the house next door and everyone made it out. No injuries were reported. The cause of that fire remains under investigation. Fire investigators also looking to the cause of this fire at the Three Amigos Chinese food restaurant in the 300 block of Northwest 36th Street. This one on the west side. Firefighters were met with heavy smoke and fire as they got to the scene a little before 10 last night. It took crews about 20 minutes to put the fire out and again no injuries reported there either. Part of Pride Month is having difficult conversations about LGBTQ issues, replacing negative stigmas with educational awareness. The Pride on the East Side Festival aimed to do that today in a fun and empowering way. The night team's Camille Yuwada shows us how health resources on site are not only transforming negative stigmas, but also keeping the community healthy. It's hard to see the sunshine through. Drag queens, water slides, vendors selling snacks. The Ella Austin Community Center was full of LGBTQ pride. The more that we can. The event coordinator Thomas Evans says pride is more than a celebration. It's a time to bring awareness about the human immunodeficiency virus or HIV. HIV is not the end. And if you have the right help and we get the right resources which are linkage to care, then this is something that can be very manageable. The San Antonio AIDS Foundation was providing on-site HIV testing along with the Alamo Area Resource Center, which also offered resources like counseling, connections to treatment, and financial aid to help with HIV treatment. I was at first genuinely surprised how people just didn't know things. Uh, they think that it's a death sentence still, and this, is, this isn't the 80s. The fact is that there's statistics proving that people who are diagnosed who get on treatment, they can outlive somebody who doesn't have it. Educational awareness does make a difference. The FDA recently abandoned discriminatory blood donation guidelines that were set back in the 80s when little was known about the virus. The new FDA ruling will remove an abstinence requirement for gay donors and it will ask all donors about their sexual history. The ban as, as it was, was extremely discriminatory and it prevented us from saving lives. So. District 2 Councilman Jalen McKee Rodriguez, who is openly gay, says the change is welcome and much needed. 
Now, by the fall, you'll be able to see those changes on the questionnaire sheet that you fill out when you donate blood. It will now ask both men and women about their sexual history. And if you're in need of HIV resources, we have all of that on our website. Just click on this story. Reporting live from the Gay District, Camelia Juarez. People are waiting a lot longer to breathe in that new car smell and delay paying a new car note. Instead, they're opting to keep driving their old cars. But for how long? A recent study gives the answer. Plus, toxic chemicals on shelves next to candy and other food, just one of the many health violations inspectors found. Tim Gerber tells us what they found behind the bathroom door. Hundreds of thousands of Americans undergoing cancer treatment being dealt another blow. Hospital and treatment centers now dealing with cancer drug shortages. What's causing it next? The FDA is now working with foreign companies to handle the nation's current cancer drug shortages in the U.S. As ABC's Whit Johnson reports, while regulators tackle the manufacturing side, patients who are about to start or who happen to be in the middle of chemo treatment say their fight to survive is now in jeopardy. Medical experts are sounding the alarm on the nationwide generic cancer drug shortage, adding to the hardship on doctors and their patients. The light at the end of the tunnel was there, and then to be thrown this curveball, just very shocking. 39-year-old Ryan Dwar says he had just four rounds of chemotherapy left in his fight against pancreatic cancer when he received devastating news. The potentially life-saving drug he needed was in short supply. There was priority, uh, you know, just based on, you know, kind of the need. And so as far as rationing out goes. And so in my situation, I was not high enough in the area of need. Duars is one of the thousands of cancer patients across the country whose lives could be at risk due to a low stock of two popular generic chemo drugs, cisplatin and carboplatin. According to the FDA, there's currently a shortage of more than 130 drugs caused by factors like changes in demand, manufacturing problems, and supply chain issues. The American Cancer Society says cancer drugs are in the top five drug classes affected by shortages and have limited treatment alternatives. The application of chemotherapy is a science way more than it is an art, and it's a regimen. So it's like imagining that you're trying to make a cake, a very high stakes cake, and that you're missing a few eggs, you're missing a little flour, and thinking that the same thing's going to come out. It doesn't happen in cooking, and it certainly doesn't happen in cancer care. The Association for Accessible Medicines telling ABC News in a statement it stands ready to work with the FDA and the administration to ensure that drug shortages are prevented and or resolved as soon as possible to ensure patients benefit from safe, effective, and more affordable generic and biosimilar medicines. That was Whit Johnson reporting. The FDA is reportedly importing the medication cisplatin to boost supply, and a Canadian pharmaceutical company will distribute it on a temporary basis. The FDA says the 50 milligram vials will be available for order by healthcare providers starting on Tuesday. Well, that was a loud, loud storm it last was. night, I and was just very getting ready bright. to wrap up and go to bed, and then the dog said, "Nope, something's coming," and then we stayed up a little bit. Yeah, it's like a little party, but <laughs> there were there were some of those power outages, but we do know that we needed that much needed rain and there's more on the way. Yes, there is. There sure is. We already have some scattered rain and thunderstorms that have been developing, especially across our southwestern counties throughout the evening. But really quickly, I want to show you a severe thunderstorm warning that has been issued for the Austin area for the most part, but we have seen it just be extended now into far eastern Gonzales County and even northern Lavaca County. This does not include Hallettsville. This does not include Gonzales, but Schulenburg, LaGrange, even Smithville, closer to Bastrop currently in this severe thunderstorm warning that runs through 11 p.m. This particular storm is capable of producing hail up to the size of quarters, even ping pong balls, and of course the potential for some 60 mile per hour wind gusts along with heavy rainfall and plenty of lightning. So really quickly here, I'm just going to put a storm track on the leading edge of this activity.
activity. This is generally moving farther off to the southeast at about 35 to 40 miles per hour. So as it continues to do so, Schulenburg, this is expected to reach your neck of the woods by about 1030 and even into Alleyton after the top of the 11 p.m. hour. This is the only severe activity that we currently have in our area, but a little bit closer to Bear County here, especially on the southwestern side of the county near Somerset, reaching over to the Lacoste and Lytle area down I-35. Got a couple of downpours there as well with some heavy rain. That stretches into far southern Medina County near Divine, more even into the far northwestern portions of Frio County there, and even farther off to the southwest, we have some additional moderate rain. So that is slowly working its way farther off to the east. Generally through the overnight, we can expect some additional scattered rain and storms to develop. It's not going to be for everybody, but we will continue to keep eyes on the radar. Into tomorrow morning, the first half of the day is looking pretty quiet out there, but into the afternoon, we've got another 40% potential to find some additional scattered showers and thunderstorms. And then into next week, some daily isolated chances do continue in the forecast. So here's the setup tonight. We've got high pressure off to our southeast. Winds are out of the southeast here at the surface as well, pumping in that Gulf moisture. But off to the west, we have a little disturbance that's been slowly working its way into far western Texas and associated with that is a dry line. So all of those ingredients have been able to combine together here tonight to spark up this scattered rain and storm activity. And generally, you can see here on your future cast, while it's not going to touch everybody through the overnight, some additional scattered rain and thunderstorms certainly will be possible. We'll keep a 20 to maybe 30% potential for a few isolated lingering showers throughout the first half of the day tomorrow. But then watch as we head into your Sunday afternoon. We put some of that daytime heat to work and some additional scattered downpours are expected before once again those rain chances start to quiet down tomorrow night and into the early morning hours of our Monday. Now throughout the remainder of tonight, I think severe weather, the threat is relatively on the lower end for us here in South Central Texas, but still an isolated severe storm can't completely be ruled out. Gusty winds will be the biggest thing to monitor there. So we will keep eyes on that for you before the sun comes up tomorrow. Temperature wise, low 80s out there right now. We're going to start off tomorrow in the upper 60s here in San Antonio. Highs are headed for the upper 80s, even closing in on 90 degrees for those that don't tap into any of the rain cooled air. Overall, don't cancel your outdoor plans tomorrow, but if you are planning on at least stepping outside for extended periods of time, keep your case at Weather Authority app handy to check the radar. We'll keep you updated there as well. Temperature slightly below average into next week with those isolated storm chances continuing, guys. Yeah, I love the low temperatures when the rain's around. So <laughs> We will take it in early June. We yes. know it's on the way. Bernie Champion Baseball making a little history, Andrew. That's right. They trailed in the regional semifinals, but they won that series. They trailed in the regional final, and today they won that series. And for the first time in program history, Bernie Champion will play at state. We've got highlights from their clinching game. Plus, Canyon goes for a perfect season in Austin. Got the highlights from there, too. Next. Smith looking to close this out today. Two and two. Swing and a miss for the first time ever. The Chargers of Bernie Champion are headed to Dell Diamond. Bernie Champion baseball made program history this afternoon in Big Board Sports, but first. The high school softball season all comes down to one final game. New Braunfels Canyon versus Montgomery Lake Creek. A battle between the undefeated Cougarettes and the defending Class 5A state champs on a beautiful day at Red and Charlene McCombs Field in Austin. Pick this one up in the top of the first. Lake Creek strikes first. One on. Ava Brown puts a charge into the first pitch she sees. And that's going to hit off the wall in left center. Maddox McKee comes in to score and it's 1-0 Lions right out of the gates. Bottom of the first. Canyon has a chance to answer after a leadoff walk. But Markaley Maldonado can't get the bunt down. Brown snags it and fires the first for a double play. And after that, both pitchers settled in. Haley Carmoda notched a pair of strikeouts in the top of the second for Canyon, but Brown was practically untouchable today. She goes the distance with a one-hitter, striking out six batters in a row in the second and third innings. The Florida commit finishes with 15 Ks on the day. And the Cougarettes had no answer. They came up one win short of a title and a perfect season with an 8-0 loss. 
obviously was tough. She's she's awesome. She did a great job against us today. Um, obviously the best we faced all year. What's the biggest takeaway from a season like this? What are you gonna remember most? Oh wow, just how amazing these kids are, and um, how they worked together and they competed. Um, I mean. To get here, to get to this stage, says a lot about this team and their character and um, and just how they, they work together with each other and, and they set goals and work their tails off to get here. Canyon finishes their remarkable season with a 32-1 overall record. The Bernie Champion baseball team forced a decisive Game 3 this afternoon at the Wolf against Leander Rouse in the Class 5A Regional Final. Chargers down 4-3 in the bottom of the fifth with the bases loaded. Grant Kinzel drives one to the gap in right center. That'll head to the wall and clear the bases, putting the Chargers back on top 6-4. To they then tack on three more runs and close it out to win Game 3 9-4, taking the series to games to one. This is the second straight series that the Chargers have rallied to win after dropping the first game and now they're heading to state for the first time in program history and the matchup has already been determined. Bernie Champion will face Argyle in the Class 5A state semifinals next Thursday at 7 p.m. at Dell Diamond in Round Rock. This will be Argyle's sixth all-time appearance at state but it's their first in Class 5A. They have won three state championships. After a lengthy weather delay, the Texas Longhorns finally battled Miami on the winner's side of the Coral Gables Regional. Texas is on the board first, literally. Top of the first, one on Dylan Campbell. Absolutely hammers one deep to left. That hits off the scoreboard in left. What a shot to open the scoring. That's a two-run blast. Longhorns go on to win this one 4-1. to In the Gainesville Regional, Texas Tech goes head-to-head -head with the hosts Florida. Bottom eight, game tied at three. Gavin Cash says, see you later. That ball is into the Disney Grove in left center. Not sure the Florida fans want that souvenir. That two-run shot is your game winner. Red Raiders win it 5-4. to four. In the College Softball World Series, number four Tennessee squared off against top-ranked Oklahoma. The Sooners could not be touched today. Bottom two, Tiari Jennings smokes one deep to left center, and you can kiss that ball goodbye for a three-run blast. That sets the tone for a 9-0 Oklahoma victory, extending their incredible winning streak to 50 straight games. The Vols will need to knock off Oklahoma State tomorrow to keep their season alive. First pitch in that one is scheduled for 7 p.m. When we come back later in sports, Rangers manager Bruce Bochy moves up the all-time wins list. So a bit of a spoiler there. Rangers did win, but it's important in historical fashion. Mm, okay, good to you. We'll look forward to that. Thank you, Andrew. You got it. You guys had 10 repeat violations. Have you guys made the corrections on yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. A convenience store with a long list of violations. This man said they'd all been corrected, but what I found that they still hadn't done when he takes us behind the kitchen door next. A West Side convenience store racked up numerous health code violations, including 10 that were repeats from a previous inspection. I stopped by this week to find out if the business had fixed the problems behind their kitchen door. Little Sam's, located in the 6800 block of Highway 90 West, saw its previous score of 85 drop to a 76. They were selling bags of ice without the proper labels, and there was a black mold-like substance in the chute of the ice machine. Raid, nail polish remover, and bleach were all found on shelves right next to granola bars and candy. Containers of food were stored on the floor. Serving tongs were stored in dirty, cloudy red water and the employee bathroom was also being used as a storage facility. Hello, I'm with KSAT 12. Can I ask you some questions about your recent inspection? I dropped in this week to see if corrections were being made. You guys had 10 repeat violations. Have you guys made the corrections on that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. While he says all the violations were corrected, I noticed they did not have the current health inspection report posted as required by Metro Health. Well, you are supposed to have that posted. Zacharia Guadalajara in the 1600 block of Southwest Military Drive earned a 74 and a reinspection. They had to throw out food that wasn't properly cooled. Raw foods were stored above ready to eat foods. An employee didn't wash hands when changing gloves. Another wasn't changing gloves when changing tasks. And a cook was touching food with bare hands. <laughs> Vietnam restaurant in the 3200 block of Broadway got an 80 that included five repeat violations. Rice and chicken were left out at room temp to cool. There was no hand soap available and no hot water at the hand sink. 
Tools were found next to pots and pans and they were told a back storage room was not approved for food prep. This Bahama Buck shaved ice in the 5800 block of Loop 410 was in need of a good cleaning according to the inspector. They got an 86. Unsanitized wet blenders were stacked on top of each other near the prep area. Hot water wasn't hot enough at two sinks. Bags of sugar were on the floor and the ice cream wasn't covered. A detailed cleaning was needed to remove syrup splash on walls and equipment. A reinspection was ordered to make sure the hot water was fixed and that the business was cleaned. For BKD, Tim Gerber, KSAT 12 News. Making headlines internationally now, a massive train collision in India kills close to 300 people as hopes to find more survivors dwindles. Two passenger trains and a freight train crashed overnight. The Associated Press reporting rescuers used torches as they broke open doors and windows to get to people trapped inside. The country's military now joining the search effort. Some 900 other people were reportedly injured in the crash. The accident has prompted renewed calls to authorities to address safety issues that have plagued the country's railways for decades. A potentially catastrophic economic crisis has officially been averted with President Joe Biden signing the new debt ceiling limit into law. This comes only days before the June 5th deadline, which is when the Treasury Department had warned it would no longer have money to pay the nation's bills. That would have prompted America's first ever default. This new legislation suspends the nation's debt limit through January 1st, 2025. The legislation also caps non-defense spending and expands work requirements for some food stamp recipients. The bipartisan deal was quickly rushed through Congress with the House passing it on Wednesday and the Senate passed the bill on Thursday. Well, whether they look good or not, those older model cars and trucks could soon be on the roads a lot longer than their owners had initially anticipated. Folks are now deciding to keep their old cars longer. A recent study showed the average age of small vehicles on the road is 12.5 years old. The night team's Patty Santos finds out there are plenty of reasons people are holding on to their car keys. Mobile mechanic Juan Salazar has been in business for 15 years. These days, he says repair work is revving up. All my work has been like probably double. He gets nearly 30 calls a day. It started with the pandemic when new and used vehicle prices began to climb. You say, okay, you know what? I mean, it's already paid off, so might as well just fix it and keep it for another couple of years. 12.5 years. That's how long the average car is on the road, according to a study by S&P Global Mobility. One of the fastest increases we've seen um, since the Great Recession in 2008-2009 time frame. Todd Campo says the trend might stick around. Uh, in 2028, we expect that there's going to be over 122 million vehicles over that 12 years of age, which is about 40% of our vehicle fleet that will sit beyond 12 years of age. His study points to the economy and durability as reasons owners won't let go. The consuming public is just realizing that not only do we are we in a situation where we need to keep our vehicles on the road longer, but they are actually surviving okay. They're still usable, they're still safe. But those who intend to keep their investments for longer than 12 years, Salazar says routine maintenance will do the trick. It's just like a baby, you know, like that, it lasts longer. Patty Santos, Quesa 12 News. Love my old Volkswagen. <laughs> Coming up, if you frequently store money on pay platforms like Venmo and PayPal, you could be at risk of losing it. What a lot of banks offer to protect your money that those pay platforms don't. And working from home coming to end for some Meta employees. How soon they'll be reporting back to the office for work.